So we're going to now try and delve into some, you know, into the from the strategic and the end of the career to kind of the really you guys are you don't know it it doesn't feel like it but you're early in your careers I can attest to how old you can get um, and more to go so so we're going to delve into really what it's like to run a company and some some tactics and things that have helped you be successful along the way I'll introduce you briefly but the bios were distributed and so I'm not going to go into into detail. We'll uh, turn to questions with 15 minutes left, so that's going to be at about 10:15, uh, more or less, and then um, and then we'll wrap up by 10:30, if not before, if you if you run out of questions. Andrew Saltoon really did a self-funded search. He had a bit of a career before he bought his company, um, and he invested a fair amount of his own money in the search. Uh, so th so that's the wrinkle in it. He he bought a company in New York that uh, is in the health healthcare service businesses. And I, I thought it was just a silly thing to do, or at least I didn't, I didn't think it was a great deal. And I, I uh, talked to Andrew, and, and but I passed what on the you deal. Said, don't invest. And did I said that. Did I say don't invest? Most likely. So, so uh, you know, from my deep experience in healthcare services, which, which actually was extensive then, and uh, and he went on to return. What was the, what was the multiple for your first investors? Uh, ten times. Ten times. Something like that. Yeah, more than ten times is what he's saying. So. Um, so, yeah, so he did that, and there's an investor clapping in the room right now. <laughs> I also was not in Chris Hendrickson's deal, but that's because I was already in a competitive company. He and his partner bought a personal emergency response services business, transformed it, and focused it um, with, uh, with really regional governments, and then has expanded it to provide further monitoring services and really invented a whole new way of monitoring high-risk patients, often called frequent flyers, the people who go back into the hospital a lot. And uh, uh, Chris also had an exit. And what was the multiple on, on your exit? We, just nine. We didn't quite catch up to Andy. Darn, yeah. So that's why we're, we're going like in this direction now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, <laughs> you know, it's, it's hard not to pick on Puchito, but, but um, um, he can pick on you back. So, <laughs> so Tony is, is, is different in here. And we're thrilled to have him here because he has a different path. He, he is at Asurian now, and um, and he is the next CEO of Asurian. He's been he's been designated as that, named as that, earned that, and he so he has become a leader um, in a different way by learning from others, but also very intentionally developing himself along the way. So he has a different perspective on on leadership and leading teams. So that's we're happy to have you here. And you know if you, you know, can you tell us a little bit about your most recent posting before you before you're taking this job. I'm springing this on you a little bit, but when you were running okay. running part of the part of Asurian. Yeah, uh, before my current assignment, I ran Japan as a region for the company, uh, which is 300 million. Uh, uh, it's a billion in revenue uh, program. Um, it was an interesting experience to learn. I'm obviously not Japanese, so it was an interesting uh, evolution of learning a culture and learning. Uh, how to deal with uh, people who may approach business in some ways similar and in some ways different, but uh, it was a great learning experience, and I think it helped. Uh, uh, it helped just generally from a leadership perspective. Rafael then Puchito uh, did a search fund, but couldn't find a company to buy, so started one in in Puerto Rico, and then after becoming an investor for a while, became evidence of the length of career in the search fund community that you can have by. Uh, by then starting a new company uh, called QMC. And could you give us some idea of the scale of QMC today? So we are in four countries. Uh, is this working? Yeah. We're in four countries, Puerto Rico, Brazil, Mexico, and Colombia. Uh, they're two separate legal entities. And uh, the international part, we're now close to 1,400 towers in all three countries uh, and in three verticals. Uh, about 150 employees and you know, continue to crank. And how many of your original search investors you know, are involved also in QMC? Our lead investor, which was Housatonic in her first deal, uh, was also our lead investor in the uh, cell phone tower business. And a lot of the group, that original group, most of the people are involved in the deal, and then we expanded that a bit. But it's, it's been a very long-term relationship, not only with my business partner and co-founder, who I've been partners with for 20 years, but also on the investor side. The same people that backed us the first time decided to back us the second time around. So I mean, you were a you were a, a CEO, an entrepreneur for in search. Then you were an investor, and then you did I don't know if it's really a search the second time around, but a, a startup entrepreneur again. When I did my company, I thought I would 
find a company, buy it, run it for five years, sell it, and then go on and, and get involved in a venture-backed company because to me that was sort of, I'd, then I'd have the experience to go into venture and really this has been a uh, community that I've been part of that's, which just keeps recycling the same great people and the same relationships and building on those for, you know, for 25 years now. So is that right? Yeah, 20, 28 years now. So um, it's those of you who are younger and in your first part of your career and just looking for that first success, you realize that it's really just a, it's a you're on a great ladder and a great, in a, in a great group of people. So we have some questions and some topics here, and I'll just tell you what the topics are, and then we'll delve into them a little bit. So first we wanted to talk about really human resources strategy, really people, and how it ties to business strategy, and particularly around building a team. Then we're going to touch a little bit, if we get to it, on how to develop yourself as a CEO, how, to, uh, how you all have um, thought about becoming better leaders and how you've done that well. Um, after you, you know, got your noses above water in your, in your companies. And then lastly, we'll talk a little bit about scaling people, systems, and processes. And I've heard that, that was, uh, I've heard that a number of times, sort of people first, and then the, and then the processes, and then the, and then the technology to support and, and automate those processes. Uh, so we'll talk about scaling that and how each of you has scaled your organizations, because you've, you've reached some scale that many here would like to get to. So, any of you can answer, but don't feel like you all need to answer. I would like you to answer this first one, which is, would you just talk about the team you inherited when you bought the company or when you took over your organization or pick a point of, because you started from nothing, you started from scratch, uh, uh, pick a point when you were at an inflection point of growth in the company. So talk about the team you inherited and then how that evolved over the course of, say, the first five years of your business. Andrew? Um, so when, when we bought the business in 2011, uh, the company had 12 employees, um, and uh, the CEO, part of the reason he was selling was that he felt like he had just a ton of direct reports and couldn't manage it. Uh, in our first year, uh, we probably let go eight of those 12, um, and then hired in another 15-ish employees, and then um, just to give a sense of what transpired from there forward. Uh, when we exited the business, we had about 150 employees four years later um, and um, felt like we had developed a, a senior executive team, uh, a little bit of middle management, and then a lot of uh, team members. And, and in the beginning, we didn't have any of that. It was just kind of me and 12 direct reports. Um, yeah, we had about 40 people when we bought the business, um, and I would say it was very task-oriented. I mean, we had, we had a team of 40. There was no managers and leaders. there were titles but nobody really managed or led anything it was all task oriented and I think as we as the business grew we kind of went through a few phases I think right away we did hire for task and for function I mean we needed someone who could do finance so we had to hire someone for finance we needed someone who could do HR so we hired for function um, I think as we got bigger that changed I think we've I've seen three phases so far and I would say we have had three different teams I mean None of those leaders from the first team are there. The second team are mostly not there anymore, and the third team is really where I'm at today. Um, the first one was task-oriented. I think the next one was about leading teams. Like, it was people who had managed before. They could lead people. We were hiring them for that experience. Now I'm hiring people who can set direction and hire other great people. So they're really talented at hiring talented people. Um, that's something we didn't have before. And so now we've got about 400 people, and so that as you scale, I think changing the way your team looks has been really important. Um, I think as a CEO, it's also changed a lot that I used to hire for what, you know, I would hire for what they were doing one at a time. Now you really have to step back and think about what does this team look like? What are the skills we have? Where's the diversity of thought? Like, how they work? Um, so it's a little bit more, it's, it's nice, it's fun to do it that way, but it's a little bit harder to hire one at a time. You've got to think about the whole team. Great, thank you. Tony? Uh, I'll pick a snapshot because I don't think the size of our team right now is probably relevant to the audience, but the organization that I ran in Japan was uh, the, the team that I inherited was about uh, eight people. Um, I'll contrast a little bit with what Chris said. Um, we did a lot of hiring for just good people. Um, I know you talked about task and yeah. function, and we've battled back and forth about what to do. But I think as a general rule, what we've tried to do is just find the best people that you can and point them at the opportunity or the problem uh, and let them solve it. And so we've done a lot of that, but there was a, from the team that I inherited uh, when I was running the Japan organization, I turned over three quarters of those people. Um, 
and the, the thing that I would look back on and, and say is the, the decisions that I think, and universally, we've talked about this throughout our leadership team, universally, I think the things that we regret the most is waiting too long on replacing somebody who isn't living up to our expectations or our standards or the need of the role. Uh, and so that's one of the things that uh, from a leadership team perspective that we've really talked a lot about, but we, you know, you still tend to be a little bit slow on the draw. How does that team, how did that team look different, say, three years later? Uh, the, the, the difference in, in how it looks, um, one, Chris mentioned diversity and we really, I mean, we hired, um, it's one of the things that I kind of got excited about. Uh, we hired a woman to run uh, a portion of our business and it's my belief that she is the, she runs the largest Japanese business as a woman CEO in all of Japan. It's not a very diverse culture. Um, but that was one of the things that we wanted was more diverse thought because we had these eight people who all tended to line up or were at polar opposites and there wasn't a lot of discussion about how do we get to a middle ground. That was one. Uh, and then the second thing when we were hiring great people, the other thing we were trying to achieve is how do we create a good dynamic of trust amongst the team so that people can disagree or pursue a different path without somebody saying, oh, that's dumb, we're not gonna do it, stop, and then they, they stop bringing up the good ideas. So the, the, I think the key changes were the diversity of the team, uh, both, uh, well, all measures of diversity, and then the, the trust amongst the group. Terrific, thank you. Did you do pick a point in time, yeah. Yeah, I, I, for us, I think the biggest challenge was that we went into two industries in geographies where we couldn't find the talent that we needed because they were underdeveloped industries so we had to recruit people from other industries and trying to train them in our industry when we were actually trying to learn the industry. So that was a big challenge. And that entailed, we tried to assemble, find the best people that we could, train them. But we had to go through a fair amount of rotation, especially on the sales management side, which for us has always been, I think, the, the hardest position to fail. Operational directors, I mean, we probably went through three or four. This, we're talking about our first company, uh, Billboard Company. We probably went through three or four operations directors and at least three sales managers before we could find the right one. Um, in the end, we ended up finding the right person, but it was through trial and error. Sometimes we hired too quickly, fired too quickly, hired slowly, fired quickly. I mean, all the, all the different variations uh, of, of that, of, of that uh, combination. Uh, but in the end, we ended up finding the general manager that we needed for the business. Uh, started in sales and promoted, and actually that person stayed with the company. That's, that's the team or the, the leader that allowed us, uh, my partner and I, to step out of the company the next day that we, were, that we had sold the company. Uh, you know, we were not required to stay on. I think that's a testament to the team that we have been able to build, but there were a lot of permutations along the way. That individual stayed with the acquirer for five years, and then we rehired him once their non-compete was over, and he now runs their Puerto Rico tower business. Um, I think, you know, that's a, again, talking about building talent uh, and, you know, staying with them and developing them and building that trust, that long-term relationship, and that, that paid, really well, for, paid, paid so, really well for us. So, so, in, so let's dig into that a little bit, because it's one thing to say, well, I mean, you hire a bunch of people, they don't work out, you fire them, yeah. you just keep going until you have somebody good. I mean, that, that works, but it's painful, uh, I know. Uh, so what did you learn in the billboard business that you've used in the tower business in building the team, in interviewing, hiring, and building a team. So, all, yeah, so a lot, obviously a lot of things. I like to say that we still make some of the same mistakes, we just fix them faster now. But uh, I think on the, on the interviewing side, I think we are now a lot more profound on the interviewing side. We do multiple interviews, multiple people, everybody trying to find out different things about that person, uh, different settings. I think we have also gotten a lot better at background, you know, background uh, 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 doing reference checks. I think every time, many times when we look back at someone that we fired, we, would, we could go back to our notes on the references that we checked, and many times the answer was there. We just were not paying close attention. Uh, but also, like what, what did you, so what do you, what, can you think of something that you missed that later? Yeah, sort of like. Sorry, sorry about this. Yeah. This was actually a, a funny one. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's a good thing it I'm in the telecommunication industry. <laughs> <laughs> it's, good to, it's a good thing you're funny, actually. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, this was actually a bit funny because one interview, I remember we were hiring for a real estate director, 
and I'm talking to their boss, and I you know, you know, start asking very probing questions, and she says, well, the only thing that I would say, he's a bit of a Don Juan. And I said, well, you know, what? I, I don't see anything wrong. I mean, not that I'm a fan of that, but that's okay. I mean, I'm not going to judge him for that. So the reason he got fired, he started dating our assistant uh, while he was married. Well, that wasn't the reason he got fired. He got fired for many other reasons. But, you know, it, it, created, it created a really bad uh, uh, culture and, and environment in the office. We were only 40 people, and here's this guy sending flowers to our assistant while well, everybody knew that he was married. Uh, you know, maybe you should have picked up on that. I mean, that's just a little... But, you know, reference checking has become really important. And one of, in, in Brazil, we were trying to hire for real estate, similar position. We interviewed the guy. It was phenomenal. And then, uh, you know, but I would send out, you know, the, the classic, I would send out an email to his former bosses, and nobody responded saying that they wanted to talk to me. Um, and I kept saying, this is strange. So I kept digging. When I finally got a hold of, the boss basically said, listen, uh, the reason I didn't want to talk to you was because we fired him because we caught him, you know, get paying bribes to, to potential uh, um, landowners. And, you know, for us now background checks or reference check is we become brutal to the point that some people that I have called have told uh, our, our potential candidate, if you have anyone like this guy call me again for a reference check, <laughs> I will not be a reference check for you anymore. <laughs> um, Great. <laughs> Are you, were you gonna? No, no. So how about you? So I'll, I'll, I'll we'll pull back a little yeah. bit, but talk about reference checks because that's that's someone asked me about this the other day. So, so talk about how you do reference checks, what role they play. I think um, a couple things. Uh, first off, I'd say just in the hiring process in general, one of the things that I've kind of experienced with hiring successive management teams. I think pulling off of your point. Our team has changed over as we've scaled. So at different stages in the life cycle of the business, as you get larger teams, some of the people that you hire just don't work out. And so we have definitely had management turnover. And it's just because I think the individuals might not be able to scale their talents to manage from three people of management to 30 people. You know, They just might not be able to manage and lead that quick enough. They could probably get there if we gave them more time, but we just didn't have enough time. Um, and so I think talent identification is the first thing that's changed for me is I now know what an A player looks like in a different way than I did when I had 12 people. Is there you know? any way to shortcut that for newer CEOs? Yes. I think the best way to do it is to go find a business that's bigger and go talk to them about what an A looks like and actually meet that A. So I, I didn't do this, but I had an interesting searcher come and um, interview my call center director when they were trying to hire a call center director. And they were like, OK, I, I can see where we're going. I may not be able to afford that talent. I may not be able to get to that talent. But what I'm interviewing right now is not that. And, and I think that was a big, you know, over the course of time, as you progressively hire more managerial people, the next layer up just is a different A player than you thought you had before. On reference checks and interview process, I, I think I've gone through interview process with folks in this room before, so it's pretty regimented. But my reference check is straight out of a Stanford case study, I think, which is, I call after hours, I want to get a voicemail, I say, if you had an exceptional experience working with Chris, please call me back. The best people I've ever hired, I get like 10 calls in the morning, you know, 7 a.m., like, I'll talk to you about Chris anytime. Those have been the best hires. Uh, if they don't call you back at all, I don't hire those people. I mean, you, you, and you, you want to call five or six people because somebody may be on vacation or whatever, but that's the best reference you can do. And then you develop a little rapport on the phone with the people, and you say, look, this is not a witch hunt. I just want to know if this person's going to fit with my culture and my team. And I, uh, the, the best question that I have when I'm on the phone with somebody is, you know, you've probably worked with a lot of people like Chris on a scale of, you know, one to 10. Um, you know, how do you rate Chris? Or was he in the top quartile, decile of people you've worked with before? Generally, people don't give people 10 out of 10. So you'll get, like, he was a 90%. And then you say, what would Chris have needed to do to get the extra 10%, which is the same way of saying, what are Chris's weaknesses? But it just disarms a little bit so that somebody will actually open up and tell you. Great. Chris, how do you think? So you're, so you're advising a young or a new CEO, and they're saying, OK, I, like, I'm running the business. I, got, I know I have some A players and maybe some B players, maybe some C players. How do I think about developing my team? Two years from now, I want to have a great team. 
how do I, what do I do? It sounds like first Andrew should do your references because they sound like they're fantastic. Um, <laughs> I think you, you, you frame the question in a way that, that helps think about it, which is I always try to think two to three years out what I want this team to look like and work from the end in mind, right? So I think often we'd have a conversation with the board or with investors and it's, well, you really need to replace this person and that person and change this. And I think most of you sitting in the CEO seat go, that's a lot harder than it sounds to just like, I'm gonna fire four people and start hiring people and I hope I can find them. So start with the end in mind, work your way backwards to you know, which one do you wanna work on first, where do you wanna be next? And um, I think that's you know, made a lot of difference for us. It sort of turns it into a linear process instead of I need to fix this whole team. Um, I think the, the second thing we've, we've done is if you're gonna keep people, you gotta invest in them. If you've given up on somebody, you have to move on. Like if someone's on your team and you're counting on them to be successful, they need you to help them be successful. They're counting on you to be their, their leader, their coach to develop them. So I've had that happen. I've made that mistake where I've given up on somebody and I've stopped investing in them and it goes down the tubes in a hurry. Um, so if people are on your team, treat them as if they're on your team, be honest with them, be direct. Um, and I think you know if you're if you're working backwards from where you want to be, um, you can break it down into smaller pieces and get to the right the right team. Thank you, Tony. Uh, it is, it's a great topic. Uh, just a couple thoughts I have um, in terms of uh, how do you figure out what you want. Uh, we've recently gone through a process where we we say what do we need, what do we want, and then what's great, and then we go after great. And I've had conversations with our HR team that's doing the recruiting or with outside recruiters to say, I want a great person. Don't, don't come back to me unless you have somebody that's great. And then define that. Um, on the reference side, we've done a couple of interesting things that I think are helpful. One is we've created a little bit more of a, um, a data-oriented interview process where we start with a candidate and we have a series of questions that we ask that begin with, okay, what was your last role? Okay, that was your last role. If I went and talked to your boss, what would your boss say? And before you answer, I'd like, your, uh, I'd like your permission that later I'm gonna call your boss. It's interesting what the candidate will tell you in that process, but then when we call to make the reference check, we're checking against that. That's one. The second thing that we do that I've tried to push our teams to do is if, if Andrew's interviewing for a job, he's gonna give me five references, I'm not gonna call, I'm not gonna talk to any of those people. I would do what you do, but I'd call them and say, you know, give me a reference, hey, who else did he work with? And I would go to the second order person because you're gonna get a, uh, you're gonna get a different perspective from those people. Uh, and then uh, Chris made reference to um, when, you, when you need to get, like, or sorry, Andrew, you did, what, what's, what do I need to be at scale? I don't know what that looks like right now, and there, I don't wanna, jump over your topics, but you had a question in here about boards, and I would reference your board members. Talk to them about, I need this role, what does great look like, who's somebody that's been really good, and then have those conversations. I think that's a great resource to leverage, uh, to learn more about building your vision of what's possible. Great, thank you. So you touched on retention. Uh, so I'll come back to you, Pachito. So uh, how do you retain and make sure you retain your star players? You know, <clears throat> obviously a compensation is a key component of it. You gotta pay people right. But, but I, I, we have found that's not always, that's never, never always the, uh, the one thing that's gonna retain someone. You can pay them great, but if you don't treat them right, if you don't give them challenge, if you don't give them growth potential professionally, uh, if you don't have an environment in, the, uh, in your company that they appreciate, a culture that they like, that they fit in, if you don't, I think, you know, we do a lot of things, uh, you know, from an emotional standpoint, right, to, to get greater commitment from our people. And this just really simple things that in the end don't, don't cost anything, whether it's, you know, um, uh, congratulating them about something in their personal lives, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, trying to get to know them more at the personal level, their families, you know, whether it's, you know, that, what we call the human touch, especially in the cultures that we operate in, which are Latin cultures, we tend to be more family oriented, more emotional, more, um, and, and that has worked for us very well. And it's not always about pay. Pay is important, certainly, without a fact, everybody wants to be well compensated. But I think there are other components that many times don't have a real cost associated with it. Uh, that for us have been re really successful. And we've had very low retention. I mean, uh, not, sorry, low turnover. <laughs> 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 
Sorry about that. I saw some board members jump. Uh, uh, we have very low turnover. Um, we pull the opposite approach. We just overpay everybody. You know, at least 2x market, and they just seem to stay at the company. It's, it's been pretty amazing. Um, I, what, what I would add, I just think on retention for me, there's, there's um, two key elements and then a ton of tactics. But the, the key elements of retention for me are, um, and it's cliche, but getting the right person on the bus. And what I mean by that is, in our interview process, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to describe what the company does, what our vision is, what our culture is like. And so I'm going to ensure that somebody's self-selecting in to the role, the job, like the culture of the company. Like they know what they're getting into, and they're kind of that's exciting and motivating for them. And then I have a lot of dialogue around what motivates that individual. So for my direct team, it's almost a constant dialogue. And they don't maybe they don't know it all the time, but I'm I'm always asking questions like. You know, what makes you happy at the job? What are the things that you enjoy? What do you want to develop into professionally? And the reason I'm doing that is because I'm forming a partnership with that individual. And so retention is part of my everyday dialogue with them. Hey, you did a really good job on this, and it seems to be in the direction of the professional development that you were looking for. Um, and I think the more you tie those conversations together, what are your goals, what do you want to achieve, and how does that relate to the business, then you can kind of line somebody up who is already self-selected into your culture and your mission, and you're helping them to achieve what they want, which is usually in the same direction as where the company wants you to go. That's, for me, the best way to retain talent. And included in those conversations are where do you want to be from a compensation standpoint? What skills do you want to develop? Um, you know, where do you want to be in five years? And then help them achieve that. And if you can steward them along, it goes, it goes great for keeping them in the business. So this sounds like it takes a lot of time. How much time do each of you spend on recruiting and retaining your senior team? Feedback, all that. I can do it through my one-on-ones generally. So it, in the beginning when I'm onboarding, it's a, it's a very intense process. But then this kind of retention dialogue for me is very much, you know, I do one-on-ones once a week with each of my direct reports. Sometimes Routine. they're 30 minutes, sometimes they're an hour. It's, I can do it through that very easily. How about recruiting? So if you took recruiting and retaining your senior team, other than operating meetings, which sounds like you worked this into, what percent of your time would you say? I color code the calendar, so I actually know. <laughs> um, so recruiting for me should be, I think, recruiting and retention should be in the 40-ish percent, but it's probably in the 15 to 20. How about you, Tony? Uh, I was, I was going to give the same answer. It's 40% of the time. and. I don't, I'm not as disciplined to color code my, well, my, uh, my calendar, but I do have an inherent sense of how much time am I investing in the team. And if I get to the end of the week and I don't feel like I've spent at least 30% of the time, I feel like I, I, I've fallen short of what I need to do in the week and I got to back up and reset my priorities for the next one. Because everybody gets a bunch of weekend calls. <laughs> yes. And, and, and the, the challenge is, and I think, Peter, this is part of what you're leading to, is if you do that repeatedly, if it's 10%, 10%, 10%, it will catch up to you when it's too late. Like you won't get the early warning sign that says, hey, the factory is less efficient. You're just gonna have somebody who's good who's gonna show up and say, I'm not getting what I need anymore and I found something else and I'm leaving. And that, then it's too late. And on the retention side, that was one of the things that from a, as a leader, from my perspective was, you learn tons in business school about, hey, the value of an, of an existing customer is so much more than a new customer because you have to invest so much money to get that new customer. Your team is the same way. And I would argue it's maybe even a greater disparity between the value of an existing good employee and whatever you can go find in the market. How about you? I was going to say about 30% of my time, and I do, I do color code. I think I stole that from you a couple years ago. Um, in, and I kind of balance it between three things, which is time with my team, recruiting, and just culture, spending time with others in the organization, because I think your team is part of it, but as the CEO, it's your job to be talking to all of the employees, supporting your team's needs with their direct reports or others. Um, and that flexes, right? Sometimes I'm spending a lot of time with my team, sometimes I'm really recruiting for a role. You want to have a balance, but it does go back and forth as to where I'm, I'm spending that time. Um, I. I I just want to add on to add one thing Andrew said completely, which is, you know, I think we've all heard that adage that, you know, people join companies and leave managers or leave leaders. I think if you don't do what Andrew talked about, be really direct. Like, just ask what motivates people. Like, we think sometimes we try to figure it out like we're detectives. It's like, just ask, and people will tell you what's important to them, what they dislike, what they do like. And if you're in that partnership with them, they'll stick with you, or they'll tell you when they're going to leave. You know, at least... In retention, the worst thing I think that can happen is you have a great employee that you think things are going great, and the next day they're like, 
I took another job, and you're scrambling now. But if they say, hey, I think I might want to do something different, you can help them find something in the organization. You can help them find something somewhere else. And they might even help you find or train another person. And that makes your life and company much, much more successful if you can do that. Thank you, Chris. Pachita? I would say about 30% of my time. I don't call her code. I may talk to you, see that that uh, it's helpful. Um, I think I would like to spend more time. In that 30%, I would put the culture piece that you mentioned, Chris. I think that's very important. So I'm trying to always, you know, there's the programmatic week, uh, weekly meetings, but also I try to do a lot of uh, walking around and talking to different people at all levels of the organization and trying to reinforce the culture. Many times I do that in person. Many times when some piece of news uh, about something that, that someone did at the company, some news of when that we had comes in, I try, to, I try to show how that's a perfect example of one of our core values. So I try to always tie things to our core values just to reinforce our culture over and over again. And, and for us, you know, I'm glad culture w was brought up. I think that has been a key component of our retention. And when we interview people and we talk to people, what we hear back is, you know, the culture that you have here is, you know, we've never experienced that culture in any of the other companies that we've worked so at. So let me ask a question about that. And then I'm actually going to ask for two questions from the audience on this topic before we move to the next one on building a team and on retaining a team and, uh, and on culture. So um, how do you think about HR strategy more broadly than just your team? You touched on it, several of you. It's not just your team. You've got to touch the rest of it or at least interact with the rest of the organization. Um, touching the rest of the organization might, might not work out so well. But um, uh, how do you think about issue. HR strategy and your broader business strategy, if, if, if at all? And we come in and I'll take a couple questions from the audience on this right. whole topic. I, I think it's got to be perfectly aligned. I mean, you can't. But what does that mean? Well, it, it means everything from, you know, you, got, you talked about fit and hire for the culture, right? If you, if you start, if you have a set of core values, if you have a very strong culture, if you start hiring people that don't fit. How do you know? Well, you know through the interview process, you know through the background check, through the reference checking. You know, you talk to, I like, you know, some of the things we do, we also go beyond, you know, these are the five that you gave me, but I start, we start branching out to other people. I mean, you don't know until you know, but you get, if you know how to interview properly, if you know how to ask the right questions, if you know how to ask the references, if you go to the right references, you'll get a good feel for the person. Um, and, and if you don't, you're doing something wrong. And, you, and you know, that may lead to you made a wrong hire. But, but I think it starts with that. If you know what your culture is, if you know the type of person that you're looking for, you got to see if there's a fit. If there's not a fit, you know, pay is not going to be, you know, pay is not going to be the reason why you retain them or you want to keep them there. Um, and I think, you know, so it's an issue of people. If you look at your whole uh, 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 HR strategy, it's hiring. It's, it's role, role design or job design, it's structure, you know, how are people in different roles? How does that fit with the organization? Where do we want to go? Clear, you know, clear definition of roles, goals. Um, I think great. everything, everything needs to be a... Uh, I see something over there, sorry to no, interrupt. No, no. I, I was just gonna say, at like a highly tactical level, like um, I, I think culture management, and this is a lot of what Pochita is saying, is first you need to know what your culture is. And so that's something that we write down. And I think most organizations will do something like that, offsite with management, whatever it is. I've seen, you know, uh, Shuran has these beautiful, you know, 13 elements or whatever it is. And I think even if you just come up with four things that you're all aligned around, great, right? So start with writing down your culture. Next thing you're gonna do is you're gonna actually build questions into your interview process around those cultural elements. So like if you valued crazy hard work, one of your interview questions would be, do you start work at 6 a.m. and end at midnight? Like that, that would be a perfect alignment. If the person says yes, you're like, okay, I think that might be a good fit, you know? So you, you wanna figure out those questions that speak to the culture. And then what I, what I tell folks is as we start scaling, the biggest challenge in managing that culture is um, other than reinforcing those elements and hiring the right people on the bus is just keeping it, keeping it going as you scale and as people are hiring people who are hiring people. And so the easiest way to tell people what you believe in is actually to fire for culture. So you can hire tons of people and it shows kind of what you're looking for, but people don't really get to know those talents until six months later. If you show what you can't put up with and what is inconsistent with culture and you fire for that, and you don't have to do that in a uh, disrespectful way, you can help people move on, all that kind of stuff, but that shows more about what you value as a company and I think it starts at the top. So. Uh, if you have three great managers on your executive team and, and one who's weak, 
that shows that you are tolerant of weakness. If you let that person out of the organization, the organization breathes and says, okay, that's consistent with my culture. I know what I'm going for. And Perfect. I, I think that's, yeah. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you.